What influenced your new show? What influenced our new show, I think, was a spirit of renewal in America. It was uh, the text themselves by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That 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 spirit of hope, spirit of possibility, spirit of 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 uh, unconditional love for one another. Continuing on to Malcolm X, working back with old designs that we had come up with in the very early 80s when there wasn't much hope, when we were in the poorest congressional district of the United States, when uh, we needed to create art just to survive psychologically, spiritually, I would say even physically. And then continuing on to uh, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs and having those beautiful white ribbons of redemption and, and hope and, and sanctification, and then continuing all the way into the back with the works of, uh, of all people, Richard Strauss, who's a, a, a composer from the early 20th century, who is writing a piece called Metamorphosis, and he's taking account of all the amazingly difficult uh, and, and sad, sad situation after World War II. Uh, and, but, and in a way, it's some of the saddest music you've ever heard in your life. But what is amazing about Strauss is that he wrote it. If you're that sad, you give up. Why, why even bother with art? So I think it's about metamorphosis really means about this continuous process of change. And I think that's what KOS and I are going through right now. I think that's what the country's going through right now. It was certainly about the Obama moment. But it was also to make something that felt uh, powerful, that felt hopeful, and, and, and something to give us strength and inspiration to keep on going to, to turn this very turbulent but very exciting time. Well, uh, back, in, back in, the 19, in the 1990s, you used to work in the South Bronx. You, you were very based there. Uh, well, we watched the inter we watched the interview with, uh, we had watched the actual documentary about your work then. It seemed very like low budget and seemed, well, like I'm not being critical, I'm saying, like you didn't have a lot of resources available to you, and you were ve you were very limited in like what you could do. Like, how do you think in the past 10, 10, 20 years, how has that changed since now you have like a global sort of impact? Like you just got back from Athens, right? And then we just got back from Naples, and we have a big show in New York, and uh, yeah, and we're gonna have a big show at the Tang Museum up at Skidmore. Well, it it, it comes in in waves. It's like the you know one of my favorite things in New York is the cyclone roller coaster in Coney Island, and our our collective life has been like that. I mean, we started in the South Bronx. I was a public school teacher teaching special ed, at intermediate school 52 on Kelly Street in the South Bronx. When the South Bronx was boom boom bang bang, ah, ah. and 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 uh, and all of a sudden we pulled it together and stayed in the neighborhood. I still, I live and work in the neighborhood still. We still have a small studio there. And so we started out with a whole lot of nothing except spirit, confidence, determination, naivete, and, 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 and built something and made history. So we had nothing and then we kind of had it all. And then we went through some tragedies and some difficulties and hard times and we lost it all in terms of resources, but what we never let, what we never lost was was that spirit and that determination and, and the belief in ourselves and the belief in our work. And I think if you maintain that as an individual, as a group, you, you, you can't fail. There is no failure. And, and, and I, as I keep saying, the only thing impossible is impossibility itself. And I think we've proven that over the, now we're almost 30 years into the project. Well, do you think like the process that actually changed? Though, like before, it was very like a personal project. You worked with the students that that were recommended by like let's say the guidance officer. They said these these kids, they might be failing all their classes, but they just have this drive for art. But now it's almost like on a global scale. Do you think like by going on a global scale, have you sacrificed like the the per, like the personality of it? Like is it impersonal now? Or? No, I think it's gotten even more personal. I think uh, I think what's happened is that now we get, I call them the knuckleheads, and the knuckleheads, we just get international knuckleheads as opposed to kids that just for, were from the neighborhood in the Longwood section of the Bronx. You know, young people are almost the same everywhere. I'm, I'm happy to report, and especially kids that hate school but love art. That has always been my specialty, to work with those sort of students. And now what we're doing is we're working with more satellites within the city. So we're going to be working with PS50, which is in East Harlem, 
We're also going to be working with a, a, a junior high school in the South Bronx, and we're also going to be working with Henry Street Project down on the Lower East Side. So it's, it's pretty fantastic to have these communities that are intact, that are secure, and we can kind of dip in when we want to to start collaborating with youth all over the city. Uh, we're, we're, we're excited. Well, that's another thing, though. Like You describe it as collaboration, as in, like let's say you go, you have a workshop, you, you could talk to them, you could kind of share your own views, and you could had that momentary impact on them, but before, like at least to me, it's it, it was more like that the students of KOS, they would they would come to you as more of like a long going process. It's it's very personal in that personal in that they they would come to you you like every week every month you you'd continuously do this. But now it's almost like you visit from place to place. You 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 go to one workshop to another, and then do you think? Do you think that doesn't have as much impact, or that that doesn't have as much impact? But you have to be, you have to see, for example, Ala Ebdekar, who is now in San Francisco and is exhibiting all over the place. I met him in one of the workshops, and we stayed together. I met him when he was like 15, 16 years old. Now he's in his 20s. He's teaching at, he went to uh, San Francisco Art Institute, and then he went to Stanford University for grad school, and now he's teaching at the University of California at Berkeley. So you don't know who you're gonna pick up on in terms of the long-term relationships. I know for a fact that whenever we get together, with one of these temporary, so-called temporary workshops, especially if it's in the city, what happens is you bond with one or two or three, and next thing you know, they show up at the door. Right? Can we continue this conversation? And uh, so it doesn't even really, especially because of the internet now, it doesn't really matter where you're located. It's about that personal connect. So frankly, I think I even have a stronger personal connect because uh, we, we, we spread our wings much, much wider and we're able to touch the lives of many more people. How do you want to influence the people who see your art and young people like us? Oh, well, we, I've, I've always thought you just kind of have to put it out there. And I think my, in terms of influence, you have two sort of influences. I have a, a pretty strong personality as an educator. And as I talked about in our other interview, I stopped being a teacher a long time ago. Teachers are great, but they show you stuff, they're resources. But an educator comes from the Latin educare, which means to draw. It's like drawing water from a well. It's like drawing, making a mark. And what I think I have the power to do is I have the power of discernment. I can look at you right now, and I can discern your talents and your gifts, and I'm going to pull that right out of you, whether you like it or not, all right? And so I'm not giving you anything. So my influence is, I think, to inspire you to, to be as excellent as you possibly can be. And I think everyone can be way more excellent than they actually are, especially young folk, and especially young folk from distressed neighborhoods and neglected neighborhoods and, 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 and rejected situations. And so that's one form of influence. Now, that's pretty temporary. That has to do with you and me, right? But the artwork, how that influences folk, that, that's a powerful thing because that artwork lasts. You know, th those paintings, hopefully, unless someone rips them up and burns them or whatever, but they, they're gonna be around way longer than, than, than my butt's gonna be here on the earth. And so what we want to do is make something that is going to inspire and, and, and excite and, and generate power in, in people way beyond the lifespan of, of the process of making the work. That's why we make art. I love art. I love art because, you know what, those paintings, they don't move. You watch video, you can do you know, YouTube, you know, all records, all that stuff, movies, great. Has maybe a lot more popular, has a bigger impact financially, but fine art, paintings, especially sculpture, they don't move. They're the only thing in this universe that doesn't move anymore. And you can come back to it year after year, especially if it's in a museum. That's why we're so excited about working with museums, because you think you're looking at a work of art in a museum, really it's looking at you. It's reading you. Every time I go to the Museum of Modern Art, and let's say I say, see a Cezanne, that I, I, I mean, I measure my growth as a, as a, as a person, it, it looks at me. It measures me. It relates to me. And so that's the power of it. It's the one thing in our society that actually doesn't move and stay still and, and, and can impart some, some wisdom to you if you're open enough to take it. Where do you see yourself and your art in the big scheme of the art world? 
Well, after 30 years of this stuff, uh, when, you know when I started at IS-52, and I was supposed to be, only be there for two weeks, and I met these amazing young people, gifted, brilliant, excellent, who had been categorized as learning disabled and emotionally handicapped, and I mean, they were destined to be junior high school dropouts. And I went in and I just, I, 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 it, from the bottom of my soul, I felt this weird force. It sounds crazy, right? But it really, I felt this voice and this force and something was pressing me in the back. You, you need to stay here. And it wasn't easy. But I, I told the kids, you know what, I'm not here to be a nice missionary type. And I'm not, I'm not here because I pity you. And I, I'm here because I know we're going to make art. But I, I definitely, I just feel, I intuit that we're going to make some kind of history. What do you think? And they're all like, he crazy, he's like totally crazy. <laughs> and then they looked at each other and I'm like, yeah, woof, woof, we'll make history. Let's do it. Let's go for it. They had the trust in me, the confidence in me, and that amazing, uh, amazing spirit to go ahead with this crazy white guy from rural Maine who said, you know, I think we could pull this off. And 85 museum collections later, hey, I think we done did it. So it's really about um, making a certain sort of history that belongs to us. And it, and, and, and it is not written for us, it's written by us. Art can do that. Well, uh, have you ever been confronted with, like, uh, with someone who you work with who kind of you have you ever wanted to give up on a student because like they, they may they may not want to, to try hard enough? Like, has it ever been that frustrating working with working with uh, some kids who who like might not value as much as you would hope they would? Never. 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 That's simple. Never. Now and the only the only way it doesn't work is if they don't show up or run away, and we've had that. But no, never. Never. I know what I know when I know when I know that somebody's got it going on. And, um, you know, it's, it, you know you can, a, lot of, a lot of folk can accept failure. Failure is kind of easy to handle, believe, to believe it or not. You can just lay back and be a victim and, oh, poor me. To be a success requires a certain amount of responsibility. And I think a lot of young folk, especially, <clears throat> are afraid of their gifts. And they play small. And my job is to lift you up and raise everyone to a level of the highest common denominator. Uh, so many times, I think especially in the public schools, we've been teaching to the lowest common denominator instead of expecting uh, the best from all our young people and really inspiring them to rise to the heights that they're capable of. And um, maybe you can relate to this but yeah you got it going on and so that's my job is to be a coach and to be inspirational and not to be delusional i mean you, you if you're getting d's it's going to be hard to get through so but then you figure out practical structural ways in, in order to improve your grades and improve your habits and improve your lifestyle to improve your attitude and one thing that we do through the making of this work is i mean you go downstairs to that gallery and you see what we make I'm still proud. I don't know about KOS. I think we're still pretty proud. What, what, what's great about art and the arts is that you demonstrate your excellence. You have to prove it. You can't have just some person patting you on the head, oh, you're wonderful, oh, you're so great. No, you got to prove it. And this is not for you know, your art teacher. This is for, I mean, the New York Times looks at this stuff. The art, everybody from the public looks at this stuff. And then you negotiate, you know, well, is their, their opinion important? Is it not? But it's really part of the world. And that's what I love about what we do. Uh, do you think, like, uh, like there's, there, there are flaws in the way that art is handled in public schools? Like, I took art appreciation as, as a freshman. And honestly, I, uh, I don't think the teacher did a very, well, I don't want to be overly critical, but sometimes the teachers just, it, it seems as if it, they have to, like, go by the book, you know? assign, you know, like, uh, draw a self-portrait today, do this engra engraving tomorrow, like, this is, this is pretty much what art is, this is what you have to learn. Do you think, do you think there should be more, like, dynamic, more open, creative process, like, with the way public school art is teaching? Uh, well, Thought. my experience, it depends on the practitioner. I've seen amazing art teachers, I've seen very mediocre art teachers. I've seen, uh, what's interesting, though, is that, uh, 
uh, again, it's the difference between being a teacher and an educator. And, and uh, what I always had the great delight in is to having my young folk make what they want to make, but under a certain sort of guidance. And teaching about materials, teaching craft, it doesn't change. I'm a professor at the School of Visual Arts here in New York. And, and, and it doesn't even matter what age you are. That my role is still is, to, is one of encouragement and inspiration so people can break out of what they think art should be. And I think we need that. Too many art teachers are not artists. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And I think it's very difficult if you're not engaged in the creative process yourself to impart the joy and the enthusiasm of making things. The sheer joy of making something as opposed to sitting home and watching it on TV and just consuming stuff all the time. But to, to make, the act of making, uh, is so exciting and, and ecstatic when you get it to a certain level that that's what needs to be imparted on our young folk. My name is Robert Branch. I joined KOS when I was 16 years old. I'm uh, from the South Bronx. Grew up a few blocks away from the uh, Bronx Museum, uh, 10 of 164th Street in Walton. And uh, I've been a participant for over 16, 15 years. So uh, it's been a great experience. Um, uh, and I've had a lot of wonderful opportunities as a result of being part of this project. I'm Wesley Berg. I uh, joined KOS about a year ago when I was 23. I met Tim at the School of Visual Arts um, where I studied. I got my BFA degree back in 2006. Um, I grew up in Minneapolis and came to New York about seven years ago and working here still. My name is uh, Rick Savignon, I'm 37 years old, and uh, I've been working with Tim for about 25 years now. Um, so I'm kind of like the oldest, one of the oldest veteran members in the group. Um, but, uh, and I met Tim during a summer program that I attended when I was a teenager. And he actually took the job on during the summer to finance the studio for KOS. And uh, out of probably about 15 students, he asked my best friend and I if we wanted to join KLS, and been working ever since. Um, my name is Steven Vega. I'm from Middletown, New York. Um, I've been in the group for about six months now, and I met Tim uh, at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, that's where I'm attending uh, school right now. I'm a senior there. Well, with as much work as you guys have done with, with Tim and how much influence, like, well, he's, very, uh, he's a very inspirational person. What do you think you might be if, if you weren't to have met, met Tim? Um, I definitely probably would be in the arts. Um, I'm kind of like a computer person. And a lot of my friends are all artists, musicians, uh, photographers. So I would probably be doing that. And I mean, when I'm not busy working with Tim, I'm actually uh, designing showrooms for fashion companies. So I, I, I would probably say that I probably would be on the path of where my friends are. Just either doing uh, computer programming or, or do desi doing design work as well. But I also, but, uh, also paint and draw, so I think I would continue that, my, that passion. I can't imagine, Tim has been a part of my life for so long. Um, uh, and, and soon, I think, after this year, Tim, I will have known, I've been more years in my life with Tim in my life than I had years before I met Tim. <laughs> So I can look at my life as post-Tim and pre-Tim. And I can't really imagine um, uh, what my life uh, <laughs> would be like without him. Uh, I, I um, uh, owe a great deal of, uh, to him. Uh, the philosophy and the education that I uh, was able to acquire while working in this project uh, is, is a vital part of my life. Every day um, I come across experiences that I, would not, I don't think I, would, I could not appreciate um, fully before I um, got involved in this project. And um, uh, I'm really grateful for that. And, uh, and you know, as a result, I've gravitated towards uh, working not just in arts, but in education. I'm a film and video producer, but I also um, uh, have a background in teaching. I have a master's in education from Columbia University, at Columbia University's Teachers College in Instructional Technology and Media. I went to art school. And I just don't think I'd be able to, would have been able to accomplish those things without um, the involvement. Uh, without meeting Tim and you know the support and um, a camaraderie that I, I I received in the studio from the other members of KOS. What, did, what, what was your first impression of Tim when you first met him? Well, I met Tim during uh, at School of Visual Arts, and 
I, I had no idea of his involvement in the art world. I just always saw this, you know, very charismatic guy walking around in a black suit. I'm, like, I'm going to ask this guy a question. I'm going to ask him to evaluate my work. And within two minutes, he's circulating around my work, and he asked me, do you believe in love at first sight? And I said, yeah. And then that was, you know, that's how the relationships bond. And, you know, that's, that's the, when you meet these, there's spirits within, you know, art. And, and that, that's where we all connect. And that's why we're part of this. That's why we have this group. That's why Tim does this, because he's a medium for these people who really have this energy to put into a, vi a real visual and physical context. I had known Tim through uh, art books and history books and the art book and all these other things before I had uh, been to the School of Visual Arts. And when I was a senior, I finally had the chance to study with him. And I went to the register's office. They told me the class was full, and that was it. And I walked out of there saying, oh, Tim's the big shot. Everyone, you know, I had this, uh, you know, this, you know, I said, oh, whatever. You know, I'm going to sign up for someone else. That's it. And I ended up a couple weeks later attending a, uh, uh, after class seminar thing about attending graduate school and Tim shows up about five ten minutes late and comes in like a tornado talks over everyone tells everyone you got to do this you got to go to school you know you have to get involved and get your work together and do all these things and the following Monday he was down uh, in the studios at School of Visual Art and I walked up to him and I said you know I have to be in your class and he said yeah and that was that was it so <laughs> well, I met I met Tim uh, during an after like a summer summer art program, and I went there with my best friend. And um, Tim, he just came. We we had one teacher one month, and then the next month was Tim. So the first teacher, she was very you know very calm. You know, we always got over on her. We would take materials and just I would make sculptures out of you know anything, and she would just flip out. And Tim comes on in. We think he's gonna be the same way. He comes on in very militant. You're gonna learn about art. You're gonna do this. You're gonna do that. You're gonna, what is that? What, what are you drawing? Do you know what the history, do you know where that comes from? And he comes in like a Tasmanian devil, pretty much. And he just tears the room apart. Uh, he's not patronizing. And he just talks to you at a level that you know that you need to get there. You need to, you, that's the level that you need to go to. And so, um, I think it was after the first or second day that he was there. I went home and I opened up my encyclopedia and there was uh, artwork, uh, some artwork, I didn't even know who it was. And I copied it and I brought it back. And I, I say, I always say like Tim, when Tim steps into a room, it's almost like, it's like he, his energy is very contagious, you know? Once he, he's in the room and he's just like, you just get the energy, you, you get it, you feel it, and then you, you turn that energy into yours. And so I came back and I showed him the artwork that I did. And he goes, well, do you know who the artist is? Do you know where that's from? Do you know what era? And that's where the teaching process started. And, and uh, ever since then, I've been, we've just been working together. I noticed in the new pieces that you, that you use different, um, different kinds of blacks. What, how did that come about? Black is essentially all colors. You know, I think uh, exploring with the different diversities and how it, we're all the same format, you know, we're all have fingers and, you know, feet and faces and, uh, um, but we're ultimately susceptible to environment. And I think uh, looking at these different color blacks, there's, there's a certain depth within that that you really have to look in to see what you want to see what color you want to see at least for you know for me making the work there's the one birmingham jail where it's you really see all the different color blacks and it becomes optical and i think that's within itself i think that kind of speaks for itself on the different formations of black and then also within contrast the the um the slave girl piece which is just all white ribbon flowing um, and they're in a similar context similar format the, the stripes and everything but um, it's amazing, just color within itself, humanity. Well, I, I like to say that, I mean, uh, for me, like, the way I see it is that each of those colors, it's all black, but there's what kind of black? There's many different types of blacks, many different types of reds, 
but each one, each 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 bar, is uh, is an individual. You know, each one of those bars, each one of those colors is is one person. It's a, it's an individual, a single person, and uh, but then combined, so it's it just it it makes it whole of how we work together and how we, we, we come about in making the work also. When I was 13 years old, and my hero was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, even being in rural Maine, you were not uh, untouched by the civil rights movement and all the, the, the amazing events you saw taking place on TV every night. And uh, yeah, you're talking about service, you're talking about having an impact, but you don't have to wait until you grow up. Um, look at the marchers. Marchers were teenagers your age. They were uh, even middle school students, elementary school students, little kids were marching. And I will never forget a moment when a TV reporter talked to a little, I think she was five or six years old, and, and, and uh, he goes, you know, you're a little baby, why are you marching? What, do you, what, do you, what are you marching for? And she said, feed them. We want feed them meaning freedom. And everything you're gonna do in your future really should be about the construction of freedom. And that's what all art is. It's a dress rehearsal for the construction of our own freedom. It's a demonstration of the possibility of imagination to create freedom. And I'm very excited to know you all. And I'm glad you're here today.